director in the 1991 series of the Lou Douglas Lectures on Public Affairs. These lectures are given to honor the memory of Lewis Douglas, a distinguished professor of political science at Kansas State University and a supporter of UFM from its beginnings. His widow, Mary Douglas, is one of our longtime supporters. We're very fortunate to have her here with, this, with us this evening. Ms. Douglas. The continuing supporters of this series include the University for Man, the Office of the Provost, the Division of Continuing Education, Student Governing Association, the Pre-Law Club, Ecumenical Christian Ministries, and also this lecture this evening is, is supported in part by the World Hunger Consortium of the Kansas Ecumenical Ministries. The next lecture will be given on Tuesday, October 29th, and will be given by Holly Sklar. She will be speaking on the Brave New World Order and the Slow Death of the American Dream. Uh, next we have um, Scott Truler. He's another Lou Douglas intern, and he will introduce our speaker for this evening. I would also like to welcome everybody to the third lecture this uh, year. In continuing with our annual theme of the global economy brought home, we have brought tonight um, for you Dr. Lloyd Dumas. As a student, Dr. Lloyd Dumas attended Columbia University, where he earned his BS in mathematics, his master's in industrial engineering, and his PhD in economics. He then went on to teach economics for three years at the City University of New York and engineering for six years at Columbia University. Currently, Dr. Dumas is a professor of political economics at the University of Texas at Dallas. He has researched and written extensively on the prospects of international peace without massive military expenditures. He is currently working on a book entitled Threatening Ourselves, Human Fallibility, Technical Failure, and Nuclear Weapons, which deals with human and technical error in the military. During his work, he has addressed the United Nations, testified at city, state, and federal hearings, and discussed the poly policy implementa implementations of his work on more than 140 TV and radio stations in America, the Soviet Union, Canada, Europe, and in the Pacific. Currently, he is vice chairperson of the Governor's Task Force on Economic Transition in Texas, whose purpose it is to study the economic transition of Texas industries in the coming decade. Tonight, Dr. Dumas will speak on the impact of military spending on the U.S. economy, and it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Dumas. In life and in history, there are critical moments, turning points, times when great choices that set the pattern for the long future must be made. We are living in such a time now. For more than 45 years, we have relied on short-term stimulation, often in the form of injections of military dollars, to keep our economy out of recession without paying much attention to the long-term consequences of our deepening economic addiction to military spending. Today, those consequences are all around us. They are turning what was once the world's most powerful, efficient production system into a second-rate economy. At the same time, we have reached the point in history at which our technological brilliance stands ready to overwhelm our social and political capacity for controlling it. We have filled our world with toxic substances and dangerous technologies, torn at the, de at the delicate ecological web, but nowhere does our lack of social and political maturity stand in more dangerous counterpoint to our technological achievements than in the arena of nuclear war. Our pursuit of security through military means was bound someday to put into our hands weapons that were capable of threatening our very survival. Now that day has come, yet we still live in a world of nations that act more like children than adults. If we don't grow up soon, we may well blow ourselves off the face of this planet. Solving these critical problems requires a two-sided transformation. First, from an economy heavily burdened by and increasingly addicted to arms expenditure to one focused on more productive and life-enhancing activities. And second, from a strategy for security based primarily on the threat or use of military force to a broader, more comprehensive approach 
that relies more heavily on positive incentives to keep the peace. I'll first sketch the nature of the mechanism by which persistent high levels of military spending have damaged the American economy. Then we'll take a brief look at some of the key elements of what I call a peacekeeping economy, a web of international economic relationships capable of generating greater national and global security. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about the role of planned economic conversion in breaking our addiction to military spending and enhancing our capacity to find real security by, milita by non-military means. Since the deepening recession of 1982, we were repeatedly told that we have experienced one of the longest and strongest recoveries in our recent history until the last year or two, and that the present recession will be mild and short-lived. But it's really not true. What we did during the 1980s was to pump up the surface of our economy by engaging in a binge of military spending financed by an orgy of debt. None of the structural problems of the American economy have been addressed. In fact, they've been aggravated. For decades, we have slowly been losing the ability to produce products people want at a price they can afford to pay. There is little in economics more fundamental than that. And sad to say, the problem continues unabated. If anything, it has been accelerating. In the nine years between 1980 and 1989, spending on national defense more than doubled. At the same time, the national debt of the United States more than tripled, from $914 billion to about $2.8 trillion only nine years later. The nation cut taxes, borrowed heavily, and expanded its military spending. A flat military budget over that period would by itself have saved enough money to wipe out more than 70% of the increase in the national debt. The net interest on the national debt alone has become one of the largest items in the federal budget. By the late 1980s, the combination of interest on the national debt and the military budget, just those two items, interest on the national debt and the military budget, absorbed 85 to 90 cents of every dollar of federal income tax revenues collected from all individuals, families, and corporations in the United States. Is it surprising that it's very difficult to balance the federal budget under those conditions? Even more troubling, while the debt of the rest of the world to the United States was $100 billion at the end of 1980, only five years later, the U.S. owed the rest of the world $100 billion. Now we are over $400 billion in debt. We went from the world's largest creditor nation internationally to the world's largest debtor nation internationally in less than a decade. A great deal of capital will flow out of the U.S. over the coming years as we attempt to pay off this huge accumulation of debt. And of course, since we borrowed the money at interest, more will flow out than flowed in. But the clearest and strongest sign of economic trouble may be the enormous trade deficit. To put this in a little bit of historical perspective, from 1894 until 1970, every single year, for more than three quarters of a century, the United States exported more than it imported. We had a positive balance of trade, a trade surplus. Beginning in the 1970s, this remarkable record of trade surpluses turned into trade deficits. By 1983, the American trade deficit hit an all-time high of about $64 billion. Within two years, that record deficit had more than doubled. By 1987, the trade deficit was $170 billion in that year. There's been some improvement in the trade deficit in the last few years, but it is still running at very high levels relative to our historic performance. 
Why is the trade deficit a problem? Isn't that one of those things that economists talk a lot about, but it doesn't really have much relevance to the rest of us, to the way the world works, to the quality of our life or the standard of living that we will experience? It's not the trade deficit by itself that bothers me. It's not just the flow of money. It's what the trade deficit reflects. And what it reflects is the failure of U.S. industry to be able to produce efficiently enough to compete effectively in price and quality with producers abroad, a failure of American competitiveness. An economy that cannot produce efficiently cannot hope to continue to provide the high and rising standard of living to which Americans have become accustomed. Let's look for a moment at some alternate explanations that have been given of our trade problems, of our trade deficit. Probably the three most common are, first of all, that the problem is high American wages. It's because our workers are paid so much here that we can't compete internationally. The second explanation is it's the result of high oil prices, even though oil prices are lower now than they have been in a while. It's still true that we import a lot of oil, and it's much more expensive than it was in the early 70s. So that must be the reason why we've run into trade deficits. A third reason commonly given is that the American dollar is strong relative to foreign currencies, and therefore goods that are priced in dollars, US-made goods, become expensive to foreigners. And foreign goods priced in their own currencies become relatively cheap for Americans. So that's why we've had these trade deficit problems. Let's look at each of these explanations in turn. First of all, wages in the US are too high. From about 1865 until about 1965, American wages were the highest in the world. Yet that includes the greatest period of our industrial expansion, the greatest economic growth in the United States, and a long period of time when American products were highly competitive with those produced in other countries. American wages are not the highest in the world anymore. They're not even close. By 1980, and by again by the late 1980s, there have been later uh, analyses, American wages were not first, second, third, fourth, or even fifth. They were ninth in the world. The average industrial wage in the United States in 1987 was ninth in the world, and the top nations, the top four nations, paid wages on the average of more than 20% above U.S. wages. We're not talking about small differences here. In fact, as I recall, the number eight nation, one just higher than the U.S., paid wages about 5% above. We're not talking about differences of a percent or two, or fractions of a percent. Now, if high wages in the U.S. are the problem, then why is it that we competed very effectively with foreign producers when our wages were the highest in the world, and we can't compete very well with foreign producers now that they're not? Furthermore, even that cheap Japanese labor that people used to talk about is not cheap anymore. The average industrial wage in Japan is about the same very close to the average industrial wage in the United States today. That explanation simply doesn't work. So let's look at the second. What about high oil prices? Well, in the 1970s, oil prices rose very rapidly. And there is no question the US imports a lot of oil. And the rising oil prices certainly contributed to the trade problems. But consider that the oil prices rose dramatically when OPEC embargoed the oil, which happened in October of 1973. That's several years after we began running trade deficits, after we turned the corner on this historic pattern of trade surpluses. One does not have to be a genius economist to realize that something that didn't happen until late 1973 couldn't be the cause of a phenomenon that was well underway a few years earlier. Furthermore, in the 1980s, oil prices began to fall internationally, but our trade deficits continued to climb very sharply. That was the period of the sharpest growth in our trade deficits. 
So trying to lay the blame on OPEC or on oil prices just doesn't work. That's not a good enough explanation. What about the third issue, the strong value of the dollar internationally? In 1971, the first year that we began to run a trade deficit internationally, the dollar was in an unusual position internationally, but it wasn't that the dollar was so strong, it was that it was so weak. In 1971, the Nixon administration devalued the US dollar relative to foreign currencies. In fact, it was not until the early 1980s that the US dollar began again, after a decade of trade deficits, to regain its strength internationally. So that also does not make sense. A decade of deficits occurred when the dollar was quite weak. Now, all of these three reasons may have something to do. They are contributing elements, but I don't think they're the central issue. The central issue is the inefficiency of American industry. And that's very basic and very serious. Why did it happen? How did a nation that used to be a model, a literal model for the rest of the world in industrial efficiency, become inefficient enough to find itself in this position of being less and less competitive? Any phenomenon this basic and this important in an economy is unlikely to be caused by any single cause. Yet I think there is one cause that is primary and fundamental. It has to do with the arms race. It has to do with the diversion of critical economic resources that industry needs to stay competitive and stay efficient from the civilian economy into the military sector. In particular, the high-tech, capital-intensive nature of modern military production and modern military industrial systems requires large numbers of engineers and scientists and makes a considerable claim on the nation's capital resources. For decades now, about 30% of the U.S. pool of engineers and scientists has been engaged full-time in military-oriented activities. The problem for the economy is not that they have been doing military-related research and development. The problem lies in what they haven't been doing, namely civilian commercial research and development. As far as capital goes, let me just throw a, uh, a rough statistic out at you, try to give you a feeling. It's not a great calculation, but it'll give you a feeling for the extent of capital drain into the military sector. In the mid-1980s, I looked at the Pentagon's figures for the book value of its capital stock, of its physical capital. And I compared that figure to the figures available for the book value of the equipment, machinery, and structures, the capital stock, of American manufacturing industry as a whole. It turns out that in the middle 80s, the latest years for which these data were readily available on the Pentagon, the amount of capital, the dollar value of the capital stock directly owned by the Pentagon was 46% as large as the dollar value of the capital stock owned by all American manufacturing industry combined. That's a substantial drain of capital. Why are these resources so critical? Engineers and scientists are particularly crucial to keeping industry efficient and keeping the standard of living rising. How does it work? Well, think about it. In this country, in virtually all countries of which I'm aware, the majority of the population earns the largest part of its money income in the form of wages and salaries, payment for labor, in other words. Very few of us, as a percentage, very few of us live primarily off rent, profit, or interest. For most of us, it's wages and salaries. And that implies that you don't want low wages and low salaries. You want high wages and high salaries to have a good standard of living. People should be paid well. But the problem is, 
that for most industries, labor cost is the largest part of manufacturing cost, of operating cost. So if wages and salaries are high that means the and rising, that means the largest part of cost is high and rising. How then can companies face high and rising wages and salaries and still keep their product prices low? The answer is innovation. If you can find better techniques for manufacture, if you can design better equipment, better tools for workers to work with, if you can design your own product that you're producing in a way that allows it to be manufactured more efficiently, then you can offset the rising cost of labor with greater efficiency of production and therefore not be put in a position of having to raise your prices. For example, let me give you a, let's take a very homely and homey example at the same time, very simple example. I'm not going to talk to you about computers and calculators and high-tech stuff. Let's look at an ordinary low-tech product, the quarter-inch handheld power drill. Most of you, I assume, have seen them, probably use them. It's a common household tool. When that hand drill was first introduced to the consumer market, it was in the 1940s. I believe it was Black & Decker that introduced it first. Thirty years later, in the 1970s, that drill had a lower price tag. Thirty years later, the number on the price tag was lower. I'm not adjusting for inflation, making any other adjustment. In other words, the price of the drill, despite inflation, had gone down. Despite the fact that everything that went into that drill, the copper, the steel, and certainly the labor, for instance, had gotten much more expensive over that 30-year period. How do you pull off this miracle of making a less expensive drill from more expensive materials, more expensive labor? The answer is innovation. You find better designs for the drill itself, better processes for manufacture, better equipment to work with, etc. You get a better drill at a lower price. There's nothing magical about it. On the other hand, capital is very important to industry because it's capital that takes those innovations and puts them on the, on the factory floor. So they go into use, so they're deployed in the economy. The direct military diversion of technological talent and capital has undermined the ability of American industry to be efficient. Now let me raise and then try to answer for you a counter-argument to what I've just said, especially with respect to technology. <coughs> that is what is often called the spin-off argument or the spillover argument. And here's how it goes. When you do a lot of military research and development, you don't actually lose in the civilian areas because the ideas that are developed in military research and development have civilian application. They spin off to civilian uses. And therefore, Military research and development is a stimulus to the civilian economy and to civilian technological progress. Well, if that's true, the way the argument is usually stated, then what I said about the drain doesn't make sense. But let's look at this from, from a realistic economic point of view. First of all, yes, it's true there is spin-off, and that does stimulate civilian technology. But yes, it's also true that there is drain by taking engineers and scientists out of military, out of civilian related work and putting them into military research and development. In other words, you have what is for economists a classic case of a positive effect and a negative effect. The brain drain, which should slow down civilian technology, brain drain into the military sector. And on the other hand, the spin-off effect, which should stimulate civilian technology. The real economic question is not do these effects exist, it's which one is stronger. Well, there are a number of ways to address the issue. Without going into lots of detail, let me just lay out for you what I think is the simplest way to look at it. If spin-off were dramatically larger than the drain effect, it, th it would follow that those nations that have put a lot of their engineering and scientific talent into military research and development would be doing extremely well 
in areas of civilian technology because they would sure have some drain, but they'd have a much larger spin-off to stimulate civilian technology, so they would be in much better shape than nations that were not doing so much military research and development. Well, that argument would imply, looking back over the last 30 years, that countries like the Soviet Union should be leading in civilian technological areas. Well, maybe the Soviet Union's a bad example for various reasons. Let's look at another example. How about Britain? Do you know that in, 19, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, Britain was spending more than 10 times as much on electronics research, for instance, as Japan? But virtually all of the British electronics research was on military application, military orientation. And virtually all of the Japanese research was on civilian commercial application. When is the last time you saw a British television or VCR in your local shop? <laughs> the fact is the world doesn't look the way a large spin-off effect would make it look. It's not the nations that have done a lot of military research and development but the industrial nations that have done relatively little military research and development that are leading in civilian areas of technology. And that clearly demonstrates that the drain effect is much more powerful than the spin-off effect. What about the United States? Well, let me just give you a quick example, or rather try to quote or paraphrase at least uh, an interesting statement. Maybe that's the quickest way to handle this issue comes from a remarkable man, Simon Ramo. Simon Ramo is an interesting person because he was, he's first of all a scientist. Second of all, Ramo is the founder of TRW Incorporated, one of the largest industrial firms and a very large military contractor in the United States. And thirdly, Ramo was also the chief scientist in charge of the Pentagon's land-based missile program at an earlier point in this century. So he's been a high Pentagon official, a scientist, and a leader in industry, even in military industry. In 1980, Ramo wrote a book called America's Technology Slip. And in that book, he said, I don't think I can reproduce the quote exactly for you, but I can come close. He said, if the United States had directed the resources that it spent on military research and development over the past 30 years to civilian research and development, to areas promising the most economic progress, we would be today, that is 1980, where we are likely to arrive in the year 2000. That's Simon Ramo's opinion of the relative balance of drain and spin-off. Spin-off is never large enough, has never been large enough to make up or come anywhere close to making up for the drain. So the diversion of military sector, engineers and scientists, is a critical issue that has undermined the economic efficiency of American industry. And when you look at those countries like Germany and Japan that have not faced that kind of a drain, you see what a country can do when it focuses its engineering and scientific talent on civilian commercial areas. Nothing short of a substantial redirection of the nation's technological and capital resources from the military sector to the civilian commercial sector is likely to be successful in setting America's economy once more on a viable long-term growth path. It's not so easy, however, to make this shift. There are walls between military industry and civilian industry <coughs> that are tall and thick. And to overcome that shift, the problem of shifting and overcoming those walls is what is called the problem of economic conversion. Let me take a few moments to talk about that problem before I go on to discussing these other implications of finding security. The military sector is a performance-driven, cost-insensitive sector. What does that mean? Military producers are supposed to produce products with the highest possible capability. They are to do extreme things under extreme, hostile operating conditions. 
They are supposed to squeeze every ounce of performance possible out of that fighter plane, out of that missile. On the other hand, they're supposed to operate those fighters and those missiles in heat, in vibration, in shock. People are shooting at the product. It's a very, very difficult problem in design and manufacture. Cost to the military sector is very, very secondary. Saying secondary is being charitable. The contracts are normally what are called cost plus contracts in operation, even if they are not legally cost plus contracts. And if you hire anybody to do anything on the basis that you will pay them whatever it costs them to do it, you tell me why they should go to the trouble of trying to do it efficiently under that circumstance. So that's the military sector. What about the civilian sector? It's a completely different world. In the civilian sector, cost is critical. It's a cost-driven sector. If you produce $500 hammers and $7,000 coffee pots, the Pentagon might buy them, but you and I won't. If an industry is trying to sell products to us and to the companies that sell to us, they have to produce them at reasonable cost relative to their quality and performance capability. Cost is what it's all about. Now, the products have to perform well. You don't want to produce junk. But on the other hand, they don't have to perform to extremes. No one really cares if you can make a Chevy station wagon go 10 miles an hour faster at top speed. It doesn't matter. But they do care what that station wagon costs. That becomes critical. And normally speaking, civilian products are not going to operate under severe conditions of vibration, shock, stress. No one's going to be shooting at the refrigerator or the TV set. Although actually, in my home state, that does occasionally happen. <laughs> Usually when the cowboys aren't doing well, you know, things like that happen. But that's not, how you, that's not part of your design problem. So what you're, what you're dealing with in design and production in the civilian sector is paying a lot of attention to cost and trying to get solid performance, reliable performance under normal, relatively, relatively gentle operating conditions. It's a completely different world. Now that difference in the world does affect, but only to a minor extent, the operation of production workers and lower level clerical personnel. It has little or no effect on the way they do their jobs but it has a tremendous effect on the way managers do their jobs and on the way engineers and scientists do their jobs. So if you want to convert a military-oriented workforce into civilian commercial activity, you have to pay a great deal of attention to both retraining and reorienting the engineers and scientists and the managers. I use both of those words because I mean by them slightly different things. Retraining means giving people a skill that they didn't have, a new skill. But reorientation means getting their heads in a different place, getting them to look at the design problem from a different angle or the manufacturing problem from a different angle. You need to do both of these things. There have been occasions in our past decades, in this century, when military-oriented companies have tried to produce civilian commercial products without doing any of the retraining or reorientation of either their managers or their engineering staffs. And they have virtually without exception been a disaster for the company and for the customer. Just to give you a few quick examples. In San Francisco is the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, the BART system. The BART system was built by an aerospace company, Roar Corporation who tried to produce that product without doing any of the conversion-related retraining and reorientation. The BART system was four years late getting into operation. It cost much more than it was supposed to cost. For the first several years that it was in operation, an average of half the cars were out of service at any point in time. It was a mess. It was a mess for the company. It was a mess for the city. It was a mess. That's not the way to do it. That's not conversion. <coughs> Another example, in my home city, Dallas-Fort Worth, there is a rather large airport that I venture to say probably a number of you have been in. That airport has an automated people mover system called AirTrans. 
It was also built by an aerospace contractor, by Vought Corporation, nearby. That system still, still does not perform to its original specifications of passenger comfort and speed. It cost much more than it was supposed to. It was the subject of a series of lawsuits between the company and the airport authority back and forth that dragged out in the courts for years. It was a mess. Let me give you one other example. This is also a lovely example. It's an interesting example because it involves an interesting company. It involves Boeing. Now, what's interesting about Boeing is Boeing is a first-rate civilian producer. They produce among the world's best civilian airliners. And Boeing is also a first-rate military producer. But those divisions of Boeing are separated by a wall within the company structure. They have the same board of directors. They have a different management, different engineering staffs, and so on. This example involves a military division of Boeing, Boeing Vertol, the helicopter division, and its attempt in the 1970s to produce what they called light rail transit vehicles, also known in less fancy terminology as streetcars, for, for uh, the city of Boston. Well, some of these cars, a very high percentage of them in fact, were in such bad shape in normal civilian operation that they had to be shipped back to the factory to be put back together again. They couldn't be re repaired on site. They cost so much more than they were supposed to that Boeing went to the city of Boston and said, as they had gone to the Pentagon so many times and said the same thing, you know, our original estimates were a little optimistic. We're having a lot of trouble meeting those estimates now. We have to renegotiate the contract. But surprise, unlike the Pentagon, the city of Boston said to them, that's tough luck. <laughs> you signed a contract, it says a fixed price on the contract, you deliver the cars at that price or we'll sue you. We don't want to hear about renegotiation. <laughs> so Boeing took a financial bath producing those streetcars. That's not conversion. If you want to do conversion, you have to take seriously the need to move people over that barrier between civilian commercial industry where they're going and military industry from which they come. And without doing that, you will not be successful. Now that takes time. To even plan the conversion of a facility is liable to take you a year to two years. To carry out the plan once it gets put into action is liable to take you another year to two years. But that's the only way to do it right to make it work, to produce a profitable, efficient operation when you're finished. We can talk more about that a bit later. I want to shift focus a little to the other side of what I was saying, to the security issue. Maybe it's true that reducing military spending, shifting resources to the civilian economy would be economically beneficial. But isn't it dangerous to the nation's security? The answer is no. And there are at least three major reasons why the answer is no. First of all, there's enormous redundancy in the present arsenals. We continue to build a large number of weapons, even today, that we simply don't need. Furthermore, there have been such dramatic changes in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union that weapons which were designed and useful only for dealing with the kind of sophisticated military threat posed by the armed might of a global superpower are simply not necessary for any current military problem or any likely near future military problem. I'm talking about things like the MX missile, which has no relevance to conflicts like those in the less developed world like the B-2 bomber that was designed to penetrate a sophisticated air defense system. We learned in the Persian Gulf War that Iraq, for example, had anything but a sophisticated air defense system. You didn't need B-2 bombers to penetrate Iraq's defenses. In fact, it may be that you didn't need them to penetrate the Soviet Union's air defenses. If you remember, there was a West German teenager who flew a Cessna <laughs> right into Red Square, which is a pretty, pretty uh, impressive penetration of Soviet air defense. The alarms never even went off. 
so there is that question. It changes in the world the enormous redundancy of the arsenals. Secondly, cutting back the military budget is ultimately the most practical way of putting enough pressure on military industry to finally force them to get rid of the extraordinary waste for which they have become famous. And thirdly, redirecting resources to economically productive activity will enhance the ability of the economy to generate national security and influence, a point well illustrated by Japan. Think about it. In the 1920s, the Japanese militarists had a dream. They were going to make Japan an Asian power through the force of arms. Instead, they brought ruin, devastation, and defeat to their country. They were forced to forego militarism by the terms of surrender in 1945. The Japanese then focused their energies on productive economic activity, and so they become not simply an Asian power, but a world power. We have to go to Japan and beg them not to sell so many Toyotas and televisions and VCRs in the United States. Let me put it in an even more graphic sense. In 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. They attacked Honolulu militarily. And that set off the chain of events that led to their defeat. Now they own most of Honolulu. That's a literal fact. What they could not accomplish by the force of arms, they have accomplished through economic resourcefulness and economic power. If you think about the argument that has been raised, which says essentially, the military threat from the Soviet Union may be gone, but there is still the problem of third world leaders like Saddam Hussein and future Saddam Husseins. And that illustrates that we must maintain a very large military, virtually as large as that which we have had, though possibly somewhat restructured. Let's think about that for a minute. For the past 40 some odd years, if you look at the planning done by the Pentagon. They planned for two major kinds of contingencies. One was nuclear war or other major conventional war generating, turning into nuclear war with the Soviet Union and its allies. And the other was precisely war in the less developed countries, war in the third world. Their planning was always split between the ability to fight wars in third world countries and the ability to face off the threat posed by the Soviet Union and its allies. If that's true, then how is it possible that it's still necessary to spend anywhere near the same amount of money on the military, now that half of that threat, at least, is gone? Let me put it differently. In order to assume, in order to argue that we need to spend the same amount now on the military as we have been spending, you have to believe either that the Pentagon was ignoring the Soviet threat in the past, and we know that's not true, or that they were ignoring the possibility that some third world leader might someday do what Saddam Hussein did not long ago. And that's not true either. We know that's not true. Therefore, there has to be plenty of room, plenty of scope, for major reductions in military forces without threatening the nation's security. Furthermore, if you think about the revitalization of the American economy, the transfer of those resources from military sector to civilian, within the context of working toward the establishment of what I like to call a peacekeeping international economy, its capacity for generating security will be greatly enhanced. What, is, what does a peacekeeping economy mean? First of all, let me make it clear what it doesn't mean. I'm not saying a nice economy. I'm not saying a peaceful economy even. I'm saying a peacekeeping economy, an economic structure that tends to keep the peace. What would such an economy look like? I think there are four basic principles around which you can build 
of peacekeeping international economy. First of all, you have to try to achieve balanced relationships. Exploitative relationships, the relationships that are primarily one way, tend to generate conflict and hostility because only one party is really benefiting, the other party is being taken advantage of and therefore feels angry and ready to do whatever possible to disrupt the relationship when the opportunity arises. They create incentives for disruption by the party being exploited and therefore they require an inordinate amount of effort on the part of the exploiter to maintain its domination. By the way, I would argue that that's true of interpersonal relationships as well as international relationships, but that's a whole other story we could talk about uh, perhaps in another time. Let's look at it in terms of international relationships. In more balanced relationships, both parties gain from avoiding the disruption by settling their conflicts more amicably. In the long run, I would argue, even the exploiter is better off in a balanced relationship than they would be in continuing an exploitative relationship. And surely, that those who are exploited are much better off. This is not just my idea, incidentally. This is something which is directly supported by Adam Smith's arguments in his founding work on capitalism, The Wealth of Nations. Adam Smith goes into some detail in arguing that Britain is ruining itself by maintaining the colonies. Smith argues in very clear language that it would be greatly to Britain's benefit to end the monopoly exploitative relationships it had with its colonies and trade on a freer basis with its former colony, with what, with what would be its former colonies and the mother country, that Britain would be better off not just that the colonies would be better off. And I think that's true. The effectiveness of mutually beneficial economic relationships in keeping the peace is well illustrated today by the European economic community. This is not just a theoretical possibility. Think about it. The collection of nations that make up the common market in Europe, there are about a dozen nations in the common market, includes countries like France, England, Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium. Just think about it. These countries have fought so many wars with each other over time, it's almost hard to count them up. They have been at each other's throat for centuries, including twice with devastating effect in this century, the First and Second World Wars. Now, I will, I'm willing to bet you, take me up on it, I'm willing to bet you that if you go onto the streets of any city in any of the common market countries and stop people and ask them what they think the prospect of their country going to war with any other common market country you care to name, what those prospects are in the next 50 to 100 years, they will laugh at you. They won't even take it as a serious question. Nobody thinks like that anymore in the European common market. Now, how did that change occur? Why did it occur? Well, there are a number of reasons, but among the most important is these nations had developed an integrated economic system, a series of mutually balanced economic relationships among them, which create such benefits for all the parties in general that even though they continue today to have very serious disagreements and conflicts with each other, they all believe that they have far too much to gain by settling these conflicts peacefully and maintaining their relationships than they could possibly allow, they possibly counterbalance by fighting and even winning a war with each other. So they don't even think that way anymore. It is possible to do that. It is possible to do that. And that's an illustration of the power of the principle, the first principle, balancing relationships. The second principle, I would argue, is important, is establishing independence in critical goods. 
While it's true that balanced economic interdependence creates a web of relationships that brings us together, overdependence on external sources of supply for absolutely vital goods can create feelings of vulnerability and insecurity, the fear that others may exploit our vulnerability, the fear that the vulnerability itself will be read as a sign of weakness, the fear that others will harm us unintentionally, perhaps, while pursuing their own objectives. And these fears produce belligerent defensive behavior. If there were a greater degree of independence in critical goods, goods like food, basic energy sources, and the like, to the extent that that's achievable, it isn't completely achievable in all places, it seems to me that would help to avoid those problems and reduce that sense of it, that, that uh, source of potential conflict and war. The third principle has to do with emphasizing development. The poverty and frustration of so many of the world's people is a breeding ground for conflict. There have been more than a hundred wars since the end of World War II. Nearly all of them fought in the third world. Someday, one of them may even ignite the war that we all dread the most. There was a real prospect in the Persian Gulf War if a few things had happened in a significantly different but possible way from the way they actually happened. We could have been in the middle of a nuclear war. You can't, you can't fight poverty and frustration with bullets. Unless real progress is achieved in generating sustained improvement in the material conditions of life of the vast majority of people in the less developed countries, the prospects for a lasting peace will be poor. Furthermore, it's very difficult to establish truly balanced relationships between countries that are at radically different levels of development. Balanced relationships are easier between countries at a higher and more equal level of development simply because they have more to offer each other. And the fourth principle, minimize ecological stress. Competition for depletable resources generates conflict. Witness the Persian Gulf. So does environmental damage, which does not understand national boundaries, something that is clearly illustrated by acute disasters like Chernobyl and chronic problems such as acid rain. To the extent that we follow strategies such as the development of renewable energy resources and the conservation of depletable minerals by recycling, we can reduce these sources of strain on our ability to keep the peace. Adopting a long-term strategy of working toward a peacekeeping international economic structure that embedded these basic principles would significantly reduce the need to rely on armaments for security. The result would be greater prosperity and greater security. But the successful pursuit of such a strategy requires shifting productive resources from military to civilian activity. And as I have argued to you, that shift has to be done carefully, planned in advance. It is difficult, but it is certainly, certainly possible. Let me uh, bring this to a conclusion. The time has come, I think, for us to consign the arms race to what President Reagan once called the ash heap of history. The arms race is ruining our economy and threatening our survival. It is an idea whose time has gone. We have a better chance to do this now than we have had in a very long time. Changes in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, the fiscal pressures on the federal government, the competitiveness that needs to be restored all point in a converging direction toward major cutbacks in the military sector and the opportunity to shift resources into productive civilian activity. But it's not just our economy 
that became addicted to military spending. It was our whole way of thinking. We have to abandon the bankrupt idea that security comes only from the barrel of a gun. From the very beginning of our tenure on this planet, it is cooperation that allowed us to survive. Our ability to, to fight with each other was never half as important as our ability to work together. And that is still true today. This is all very well and good, but is it realistic? Is it realistic to believe that we could actually progress toward establishing a peacekeeping international economy, that we could learn to use economic relations in the place of military force as a primary part of our approach to security? Well, the military is a social institution. It was created by people. Social institutions are artificial constructions that people create to serve the purposes of real human beings. The only legitimate purpose of the military is to provide us with security. But war has become so destructive and the preparation for war so expensive that human society cannot continue to rely mainly on the brute force of large militaries to keep us safe. Since war-threatening military force is a social institution that no longer serves its purpose as well, it is the essence of realism to look and work for the establishment of more effective social arrangements like a peacekeeping economy. The real dreamers are those who continue to insist that reliance on threat and use of military force is the only viable means to international security. They are living in a fantasy world. Since the dawning of the nuclear age, the handwriting has been on the wall. Either we put an end to militarism and war, or militarism and war will most assuredly put an end to us. The strengthening of international cooperative organizations like the United Nations lies at the heart of our search for a better approach toward keeping the peace. The worldwide economic boycott of Iraq, organized through the United Nations, could have been, and maybe still will prove to be, the leading edge of a different way of organizing a punishment for international violators of norms of behavior. Can we find a way to make militarism and war a curiosity of our past rather than a threat to our future. I believe we can, and more than that, I believe we will. Thank you. Dr. Dumas will take questions now. We have uh, time for several questions, and afterwards there will be a small reception in the back area where you can talk to Dr. Dumas more. In addition, it's brought to my attention there will be a paper available pertaining to the last uh, Lou Douglas lecture by um, Mark Ritchie. It is a brief paper by Patrick Gormley of KSU Economics and a very good one of KSU Agriculture Economics. Um, it is a criticism of the GATT a negotiation talk that he gave last, last lecture. Questions from Mr. Dumas? Yes. so-called jobs argument has, has been used repeatedly by military industry and by the Pentagon in order to build political support for the continuation of whatever programs happen to be threatened at a point in time. That argument has largely run out of steam. Everybody knows the military budget is coming down, but many people still cling to that argument. So we do need a political approach as well as an economic approach to taking that argument away. In the Congress currently, there is a piece of legislation called the Defense Economic Adjustment Act, 
but I played a role in designing some time ago. That bill, if it were law, would require every military contractor and every military base in the U.S. in order to continue to function as a, uh, as a contractor of the federal government to set up a labor management committee independently funded to look for alternative civilian activities for that facility and its workforce to work out all the details of planning as to how to get there, all the blueprints, all the questions about financing, who needs to be retrained, what do they need to know, etc. It also provides a special fund financed in part by monies coming out of the military budget and in part by a tax on military contracts. A special fund that would pay income support, pension benefits, maintenance of health plans for any workers at any factory involved in converting the actual act of turning itself from a military-related activity to civilian commercial activity, to get them over that hump, over that interim. If that bill were law, we would finally put an end to this nonsense about the jobs argument. Let me put it to you this way. The Pentagon was not established to be a social welfare agency. Wherever you are on the political spectrum, it makes no sense to pretend that that is its function. It has a different role to play in our society. And therefore, right or left wing or anywhere in between, if the jobs problem were taken care of by having such a bill become law, by having contingency plans made in advance for this transition, then we could finally decide what weapon systems we want and don't want on the basis of their merit and their contribution to our security and not on the basis of whose district is going to lose what kind of jobs. That argument has been historically very powerful. And so that you don't underestimate it, let me give you a couple of quick examples. Henry Jackson, former senator from the state of Washington, was opposed to the Trident missile program. He was a very powerful senator. The Navy needed his votes. Suddenly they discovered that they could locate a Trident base in Washington state, which they hadn't been planning on doing. Actually, it's a rotten place to have a Trident base because it's a long body of water that could easily be bottled up. Militarily, it's not a good location. But the Navy suddenly discovered that it was probably a good idea to put a Trident base in the state of Washington. And the next day, Jackson was a strong supporter of the Trident program. George McGovern, who after all ran for the presidency once on a platform of 20% cut in military spending, George McGovern once told me that he fought the Pentagon to keep a military base open in South Dakota that the Pentagon wanted to close. That's how powerful this argument has been politically. But it's a ridiculous situation. We should have taken that argument away a long time ago. We're long past due to do that. And now there's an extra added attraction. It's no longer a theory that people might be thrown out of work by cutbacks in military spending. It's happening all over the country. In Dallas-Fort Worth, there are at least 3,000 people laid off from Texas Instruments in Dallas, and about 9 to 10,000 laid off from General Dynamics in Fort Worth. That's just direct layoffs. There are lots of other subsidiary problems. Those people are in trouble. A lot of them can't meet their house payments. A lot of them have no health insurance anymore. God forbid something happens to them or their families and they need medical care. They're going to wipe out their savings in a, in a flash of an eye. If this kind of a bill had become law, none of them would be in the position they're in now. Now, it's sad. We can't do as much for them as we might like to do. But we can surely take that example and prevent it from continuing all over the country. We need legislation like that. That's one important political strategy. Let me suggest another one. Up until this point, the federal government has been largely, in my view, abdicating its responsibility to look into this transition, to deal with this transition. And when one level of government abdicates its responsibility, 
it's only reasonable that some other levels of government try to make things happen. It is slowly happening that various state governments around the United States are beginning to pay attention to the problem of conversion. The state of Washington has funded a special commission at its state level. The state of Texas has a governor's task force on transition, I think, that was mentioned when I was introduced. Um, the state of Ohio has done some things. The state of Missouri is thinking about doing some things along these lines. Now, the state governments are not in as strong a position as the national government because they are not the customer of this industry and they do not have the constitutional right to interfere with what federal contractors do. But state governments do have the ability to raise public awareness. They do have the ability to use their good offices and their cooperative possibilities with the university systems in the state and so on to encourage, cajole, embarrass, however you want to put it, private sector firms that are not doing this job to do the job because the bottom line is no outsider, governmental or non-governmental, can figure out how to convert a facility from one activity to another. That has to be done by the managements and the labor force or it won't be done well. You have to know too many details in order to do that. It can't be done by outsiders. So state governments are politically beginning to move. They are also trying to put pressure on Washington through the state offices, through the congressional delegations, to start to take responsibility for this process. I'll try to be less long-winded in my next reply, but I can't bet on it. Yes? Uh, I find your uh, argument uh, quite plausible in general, but uh, let me ask you a question uh, that uh, this Cold War should have been going on since 1945, and uh, these indicators of economic malaise, such as trade deficits and uh, slow productivity growth, have really only come on since about 1971 or 72. Uh, but we had a large share of defense spending in the budget going all the way back to the beginning of the Cold War. So how did we do so well for 25 years? my question until the early 70s when things seemed to, to fall apart. That's a very important question. Uh, I would, the easiest way to think about it is at the end of the Second World War, the United States was by all odds the militarily, economically, and politically strongest nation in the world. We were the only major industrial country that wasn't largely devastated by the Second World War. Some of them were in complete ruins. Some of them were just badly damaged. The United States was almost untouched. So at the end of the Second World War, we were like a runner that was three laps ahead of the rest of the field. They had rebuilding to do. It was a long and difficult process. We helped them do it. It was one of the smartest things we ever did, incidentally, in my view. We helped them rebuild. But at the same time that they were rebuilding, that they were beginning to speed up their own pace, we strapped on a very heavy weight, this large military burden. But still, we were three laps ahead of them, and it took them a while to catch up. Now, if you had asked me in 1945, actually, you couldn't have done that. I wouldn't have understood the question in 1945. <laughs> but if we could sort of transport ourselves back to that time, and someone had, had uh, in effect, asked if, if I could predict when those runners would catch up to us and start passing us. All that I could have said is it's not going to happen in a few years because we're way ahead of them. But it's also not going to take 50 years to happen. It took about maybe 20 years. And that's within the ballpark of reasonable uh, possibilities. I don't think that was predictable exactly. But what was predictable is they were going to catch up and we were going to start to have a lot of trouble competing we began to progress more slowly, and they did eventually catch up with us. Yes? What uh, might be some of the alternative or ancillary arguments that would explain the uh, reduction in uh, investment, uh, innovation, uh, and uh, growth of productivity? If you, you have a single argument, must be some others. What might oh, yes, there? sure. There, well, there are a number of other things that have, that have been problems. One has been uh, 
uh, perhaps I might offend some of the business school professors in the audience, if there are any here. But uh, part of the problem has been the way business schools have been teaching people to pay more attention to financial issues than to production issues. I remember uh, years ago when I was still teaching at Columbia, one of my graduate students came into my office after the first day of classes. Uh, I taught industrial engineering and he was very depressed. I said, what's the matter? He said, I've just been to my first class at the business school, and you know what that professor said to us? I said, no, what? He said, he said, you have to remember, we're here to produce profits, not products. Now, that's a deadly message. That leads to business heroes like T. Boone Pickens from my home state. <laughs> if you compare, let's say, T. Boone Pickens with Henry Ford, you can see the difference. Ford understood making cars. He wasn't a nice human being, but he knew what manufacturing was about, and he understood how that process operated. Pickens is an expert at financial manipulation. That's a very big problem. We have to get away from that. The only way to make profits in the long term is to produce quality products at reasonable prices. There's another issue involving the attitudes of business that's also very important in my view, and that's that we have become far too focused on the short term on this quarter or this year's profits and paying too, far too little attention to what the company was going to be doing in 10 or 20 years. That is a deadly process. If we lived our lives that way, some of us do, if you live your life only thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow and never what you're going to be doing in two or three years, you're not going to have the kind of life you could have if you occasionally cast your eye into the future and make some plans. That's a very bad way to, uh, to make business plans. The other day, when I was in uh, Texas, before I left on this trip, I talked to uh, a very wealthy, very prominent Texas businessman at length about these problems of conversion. One of the things that he, he said to me is he thinks this short-termism reinforced by the promotion and salary uh, policies of many industrial firms, many companies that reward short-term profit. Let me tell you that General Dynamics, just to give you one example, instituted a policy recently that if their stock hits a certain level on the stock market and stays there for 10 consecutive days, the management automatically gets a certain bonus. Yeah, they've been doing that. And so the management's been getting huge bonuses and they're laying off workers all over the place. And those guys haven't got the beginnings of an idea how to produce a viable civilian product. It's really sad. So short-termism is a real problem. The industrialist I was talking to said, we have to start looking down the road. We have to have the courage to stop worrying about this quarter and start thinking about the, the end of the decade. I think that's a part of the problem as well. Yes. Yes, the, the United States has for many decades now maintained hundreds of thousands of troops abroad in huge military installations. Do you see any, any reason to believe, any hope that we may as a nation come to the realization that that is totally unnecessary and that perhaps those installations will wither away? I think there is, there's not only hope, I think it's beginning to happen already. Um, some years ago, I guess it was about six months after the revolution that uh, overthrew the Marcos government in the Philippines, I visited the Philippines to uh, consult with various individuals and to talk to some government officials about the American military bases that were there. They wanted to know if the American military left, what could they do with those bases? We wanted to talk about the conversion problem, and we talked about it at some length. Um, well, the American military is leaving those bases. In part, it was uh, due to Mount Pinatubo having buried them in volcanic ash. A possibility which didn't occur to me, and incidentally, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, but now those bases are going to be abandoned, and they will be ultimately reclaimed. Um, the reason for having those bases is much less than it has been in the past. 
I think we will begin to understand that it's ludicrous for the United States to have so many troops stationed in Europe, stationed in other places. Do you know that for years, if you did the, the arithmetic, you could figure out that about maybe 40% to half of the American military budget was involved in the uh, defense of countries whose standard of living was as high or higher than this country's. We were subsidizing the defense of a lot of other parts of the world, countries like Western Europe, for instance. I think those messages are beginning to get through. We don't need troops stationed all over the world now. I, I'm not making an argument that we, uh, you know, that the light has come and we can now get rid of our military, abandon the whole military industry, don't do any more research, don't have any troops anywhere. I hope we live to see that day, but this is not that day, and it won't be that day for some time. Mm -hmm. What we can do is get rid of the enormous overhang, the huge Cold War machinery, which is no longer necessary in a post-Cold War world. Yes? Uh, could you re relate a little bit about the um, aerospace industry in England during the uh, late 60s? Uh, if that was an uplifting... Uh, Yes, it's a good example. In 1975, actually, a group of unions at uh, Lucas Aerospace, at, at the time the largest aerospace firm in Europe, were faced with substantial layoffs. And the workers decided, the engineers are organized, they're in unions also in, uh, in England and at Lucas. The engineers and the production uh, workers decided that this was unacceptable, that the, rather than being laid off, they knew the company wasn't going to keep them on for, uh, for charitable purposes. They had to find some alternative civilian products that could be made with that workforce and at those facilities. They came up with 150 products that Lucas could make, and they were very creative ideas. One thing, for instance, was a road rail vehicle a vehicle you could ride down the tracks at high speed, and then when you came to near where you wanted to go, to the city, let's say, that you wanted to go, you flip a switch, take it off the tracks, and drive it down the street. There's a lot of reason why that's a good idea. If you can do it well, it saves a lot of time loading. And unloading, there are other issues involved, too. That was one of their designs. They even built a prototype of that. They had ideas for building what are called telecuric machines. Those are machines that mimic human motion at a distance, so that you, for instance, when, you, when you're dealing with very dangerous environments, work environments, uh, just to pull an example out of the air, how about cleaning up a toxic waste dump, for instance? You don't want to send workers in the middle of the dump with a pail and a shovel. That's not how you do things. On the other hand, pure robots can be very expensive. So their idea was, suppose you have these machines that will go into these dangerous environments and there will be an operator of the machine who will stand or sit at some relatively safe factory building somewhere and do things with his or her hands that the machine will then do wherever it, it is. So for instance, there's, there's an obstacle there that has something that has to be picked up so the worker is attached to electrodes and so on, bends down, picks up, you know, makes that kind of a motion, the machine does the same thing. You can do this, this way you don't, you don't eliminate the skill of the worker. It's a much simpler way to do things than developing robots that can literally think for themselves. And it's much safer than exposing workers. They came up with ideas like that. They had energy conservation devices. They had all sorts of ideas. They took the, idea, the package of ideas to the management of Lucas Aerospace and they said, we understand the military aerospace business is not doing so well here. All right, we accept that. Here's a bunch of products which can be made, have profitable markets, will keep us employed, make money for the company. The management refused to look at them, absolutely refused to look at them. It's not the business of workers, they said, to tell us what to produce. That's our job. <laughs> Literally, that's what happened. And after a number of, of course, they were also up against the British class system, which made it more difficult, too. Uh, after a number of years, the, the, the plan, so-called Lucas corporate plan, had to be dropped. The management wouldn't pay any attention to it. So that was abandoned. But it demonstrated with great clarity 
that you can find alternative products that make sense, that are profitable, that are productive, that will keep people employed without making work, so to speak, without creating artificial jobs. And that's a good thing to keep in our minds as we look at the changes we have to make in the coming years. Yes? You uh, argued that the country should maintain independence in uh, critical goods. How would you uh, define critical narrow enough to keep that from degenerating into a, uh, an argument for protectionism in hundreds of, or maybe thousands of industries? Well, first of all, I should say, because I, I won't have the chance to say it as thoroughly as I would like, uh, that I, I did a paper called uh, Economics and Alternative Security Toward a Peacekeeping International Economy. And it was pu it's published in a book edited by a fellow named Burns Weston. It's a long paper uh, edited by Burns Weston called Living Without Nuclear Deterrence. It's produced by uh, Westview Press, I believe. So there's much more discussion of this issue there. But let me give you an example. What I mean by critical goods are very basic things like food staples, not just food, food staples, uh, certain key types of energy resources. The quickest way I can illustrate this, I think, with some clarity is to refer to Switzerland, which has such a policy. Switzerland, you know, for a long time has been a politically neutral country, hasn't been in a war in a very long time. Switzerland has a policy of maintaining independence in critical goods. They keep stores of certain basic kinds of grain, although in normal times they import about half of their food supply. They have worked out strategy for converting pasture land into farmland, for changing, even for modifying their diet, for shifting the way they use energy. They also have stores of energy resources that they keep. And they have this all worked out for the purpose that if somebody surrounds them and threatens them, they can at least keep their act together. They can at least stay alive for long enough to use diplomatic means and other means to try to remove the threat. Switzerland has been doing this for years. You can look at what they do. I don't necessarily think that they're doing it perfectly, but that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. I'm not talking about trying not to trade in food and other things in normal times. I'm talking about being able to carry yourself through a period of maybe half a year or a year, two years, without finding yourself in desperate condition by, by storage, by alternate production, by whatever tactics might be necessary. Incidentally, for those of you who are here who might uh, be economists, this paper that I did on, on the peacekeeping economy was my first effort to think about this challenging question of how you can use economic relationships to keep the peace. I don't, I don't have a lot of ego tied up in it, and I by no means think that I've got the perfect answer in that paper. So it, it's a very interesting area to think about. And any of you that are interested in doing that or produce any work in that area, I'd be happy to see it. I think this is one way in which economists can make a major contribution to the reshaping of society on a global scale in the coming years. Thank you very much.